Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm... Okay, mute this. Mute tab. Testing, testing. Okay. What's the delay on yeah. this? Uh, yep, it's, it's probably about 10 seconds. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn this off. Okay. Okay, ready? 241. Yep. <clears throat> okay, where are we? Okay. 41. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Blech. Stop, 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 stop. Let me delete that. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 242 of the In 30 podcast. Let's well, stop it again. <laughs> uh, I saved it as, I think I numbered it wrong. In 30, let's check. 242. Okay. Ready? Oh, wait. Delete. Okay. <sighs> Stupid garage band. Okay. Ready? Okay. Yep. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Security Podcast here on the In30 Network. This is episode 242. And we're going to talk about my experiences with uh, the new Ubiquity uh, Dream Machine and how much I really, really hate IoT devices. And I don't know. Let's first say hi to Tom. He's this way this time. Yeah. Or he's that yeah. way. Um, some, somewhere. I think here. we're reversed. So we still, if you haven't seen the Twitch or the YouTube channel, uh, Tom Tom got somebody to make these really awesome frames for us that make it look like we're actually some sort of professionals. We have the fake, we have the real professional mics. We have everything else. Mm -hmm. We're starting to do this right, but um, so that was the last part, and we got that. So, I mean, I feel like every week we're doing like a new episode on some sort of like device or product that we really love, and. And I really do like Ubiquity networking things. Uh, Tom's not the biggest fan of them, but in general, they for me, they're good. So a couple, uh, we've talked about PFSense. I, I think PFSense is awesome. I really do like it. It's open source. It, it runs on anything. The problem was it was just, it, it was Linux-y. And I don't, I, I mean that in the most nicest way. Like I like the control, but it was just so hard just to find literally anything that I was getting really frustrated and I would not do it. So in in Tom's case, or not in Tom's case, but normally when you're 20, you're like, I'm gonna build this machine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn every line of hardware, I'm gonna do this all. Then you get married and you cut the internet, and now your spouse is like royally pissed at you. So if you're gonna cut the internet, you know that you have a ticking time bomb to get it awake. So, like in my early 30s, I'm like, you know what? Am I I'm going to get something easier. So we did. And then it's like, okay, now I have kids. If the internet doesn't work at all times, the world ends. So I need something that just works. And I still want to experiment, but I don't have enough money to get on my own separate network and everything else. So I, I tried the ubiquity stuff. They seem to work. They just released this dream machine. It is awesome. It does a whole bunch of things. So I got it. I plugged it in. It's set up. It has mobile apps. It's all this. I really like it. And then my Nest thermostat stopped working. But I'll take a, bre a break. I know Tom has something to say. Yeah, I I love uh, most of Ubiquiti's products. I, I used one of their security gateways very, very early on. This was, this was back... I want to say it was the first one that they ever put out. Um, and I, I tried to use it for one of my contracting client jobs and it just, it didn't go great. It was missing some, you know, very much needed features. The setup wasn't quite what I wanted it to be. Like their, their access points are beautiful. You set up a controller, you provision at once, you can set up everything else to just tie in. You can even replace access points and have them automatically provision update. It, it keeps itself uh, you know, up to date with security patches. It allows, you know, access points to uh, do the nice uh, passive handoff when you're walking around a building with your laptop open. Like, they're just super awesome. I wasn't impressed with the security gateway. Now, some friends of mine got, uh, got a couple of these years later. Love them. The Dream Machine came out. Uh, you know, so far, you, you seem to be liking it. I, I do. I really do. Yeah. So... So like you said, when I first got the access point, so I got one access point, I don't know, three or four years ago, 
And like you said, and I think you were playing with it even longer ago than that. They, you saw horrible support. They didn't have this. They didn't have that. And they were just, they were this company trying to beat Cisco at their game. And they saw that, that not everyone needs the Cisco hardware. Some people like want to run as, have some medium size office or small size office that they want to get going. And they offer these really awesome prices. And for, I got a access point for a hundred dollars, a hundred dollar access point that has all these features that you can just hook up to your router. You connect one wire. It does do power over ethernet, but one wire and and that's what we had and it offers so much better wi-fi then the features started coming and for most of I, I mean i'm not a big feature expert there but the features were there and and the you start reading and people are saying oh it's hard but they come out they come out and they made it so much easier i think they really listened and they said you know what if we're if we're going to be a player in this game we have to make it easier and they did so like so all these other things now, they're making it really easy. And yeah, there's some quirks and we'll get into that, but they made it really easy. And I'm just having like a lot of fun looking at the devices. Like I'll give you an example. It connects a new device. If uh, the device doesn't clearly give the company name or the Mac, if it gives all that stuff clearly, it brings a little icon. So you can see exactly what it is. It actually takes the icon. That's a really neat touch. And if it doesn't, it's like, hey, do you know what this is? Help us. And you can add your own icon to it. And that was That's pretty nice. cool. Yeah. So they're really trying. So like you said, if you haven't seen it in a few years, it's not a bad idea to maybe give it a different, a different, uh, another shot if you're trying something new. One one thing to to keep in mind, and um, you you said the magic price point. It was a hundred bucks for an access point, right? That's yeah. not. It's not a wireless router. You can't just go and replace your Linksys with one of these guys. It doesn't do the same thing. It's quite literally just the Wi-Fi antennas that take Ethernet and broadcast Wi-Fi. Um, but for a comparable access point from Cisco, because I, I was you know part of the IT squad in one of my previous jobs, and we were doing a wireless revamp in all of our buildings, and I, I remember buying old Cisco stuff on eBay just to get under that $1,000 price point because... We were we were a cash strapped IT organization. Like we we didn't have enough money to buy everything brand new from Cisco with, you know, support and everything else. So we just bought what worked. And Cisco's configuration, it was very much geared towards the command line and text configuration. They had a GUI, but it mangled and broke the, the config in several extremely fun ways, which I found out over my career. That was that was just great. So you quickly learn, okay, if I'm gonna configure this, it's gotta be line by line, um, you know, in in this config file format. And if I mess up one thing, it's it's hosed, you gotta wipe it and start all over again. Um, but you know, a thousand bucks for an access point, that's pretty hefty. A hundred bucks? Yeah, give me a three pack. And by the way, if you do want to buy a three pack, Ubiquity does sell those and you'll get, you know, a small discount on top of it for the for the bulk rate. Hmm. Um so I I have a Ubiquity access point, it's sitting up there right now, <clears throat> and I love the thing. It just it keeps on trucking. Look, it's it's and they they used to sell and I think you can still find it, they had an edge router. This was the problem with Ubiquity. So the Edge router was $50. So it was a router for $50. You buy a $100 access point, And now you have a really good system. The problem is Ubiquity came out with these different pro lines. So the Edge router was the more pro. Unify is their mid-range. And then they have like AirFi and something else. So... And AirFi is cool. It lets you beam the Wi-Fi from like building to building. And I, I really, really want to try. Point to point links. They are, like... <laughs> they are so so cool. You now, those of you at home, please do not rush out to buy one. Whatever your use cases that you're thinking of right now, it doesn't fit. This is not for home users. It's not for even like pro home users or people setting up labs in their house. Uh, this stuff is quite literally from, okay, well, we've got a shipping yard and that guy in the shack completely like four football fields that way. He needs Wi-Fi on our corporate network. Let's put a pole 200 feet in the air and beam him Wi-Fi into that little shack. That's what these are for. And by the way, they work great. So my use case is I have, I have a rental property about a mile and a half. Let's... Let's go, let's say two kilometers, 
not even let's say one mile it's like a block it's like two avenues away and four blocks like i think i i should put up a pole at my house and a pole there and it may work yeah, you, you could absolutely make it happen. Now, the thing to consider with those point-to-point -point links is depending on the technologies used, they can be affected by things like, you know, precipitation, thunderstorms, you know, wind. Depending on how you angle your towers and how you strap it down, if you get a little bit off or a little bit crooked, you've lost the signal. Uh, so you do have to be uh, cognizant of the downsides mm. of point-to-point -point links. So, so uh, aside from that, they have their all. They even come with Amplify, which I think is the is the really really bare bones uh, for the normal person. But so I picked up this Unify. They they came out with this Dream Machine. So the other annoying thing with uh, with uh, Ubiquity is that you have to buy their cloud key. It's an eighty dollar like just dongle. It's a Raspberry Pi dongle that fits into one of the network ports, and that's the controller that lets you do everything. And I feel like it's just an eighty dollar tax. So the Dream Machine came with it built in, and it comes with four managed ports, which is awesome. And I bought another access point a year or two ago. So now I have, and it comes with Wi-Fi. So I have three access points, one on each floor of my house. I have a 16 port uh, dumb switch, which I don't know if I'm going to upgrade. I may, I may, that's a little, it's like, they want like $300 for 16 ports, which I know is a really good price. Uh, 16 ports uh, managed switch that goes through the software. I know that's really good. I just don't think I need to spend that money. And and then they have like dual redundancies and dual powers. Again, they're they're moving it to like the the average IT person. So small business uh, needs an IT person, and they the people with Cisco come in and say the Cisco price is like no, we're not going to do that. And Ubiquity just comes in and it works. Yeah, I I absolutely love Ubiquity. I love them for kind of upending uh, the access point game because. For a very long time, when it came to enterprise networking, you know, it was it was either Cisco or your off brand. Like if if you're not buying Cisco gear, then what are you buying? And it's usually something, you know, no name that has no support attached that may or may not work. And if it breaks, well, you just go buy another one and hook it up. Mm. Um, but you know, I've I've done a lot of work with Cisco gear and I have no love for it. Sure, it's powerful, it's fast, it can handle whatever you throw at it. But that Cisco tax is hefty, uh, and I, I was not okay paying it. Well, I guess with Cisco, you get you get the twenty four seven support. The like come to your if if you did buy that package, yes. Oh, so that's on top of yeah. You you do uh -huh. have to have a support model, and to get firmware upgrades, you have to have an active support contract. So depending on if you buy used access point and it's it's too old or has a vulnerability. If you don't have a support contract, you might be in the woods on that one. So, so anyway, so we see the ubiquity thing. I end up buying it. I get it. I get it shipped to me and I plug it in. It's exactly as easy as you think. You bring your phone to it. It works through that low energy Bluetooth to set up. It sets up. It asks you a few questions. It does everything. And then you have all the settings in a little pretty GUI. The problem is, as Tom was saying, is that is that they're they're rechanging some definitions to make it better or worse. And I understand it, but if you're used to this, now you have to relearn something. You probably don't want to do that. Yeah. The Ubiquity has got this weird habit of taking, you know, bog standard networking terminology and then applying their own kind of brand name spins to it so uh it, it was this way with the um the uh little edge router is that you know when when you're looking for something like uh i i want to do vlaning where's the vlan tagging okay well it's called this thing over here um and now you've got to get basically used to an entire new dictionary of, of ubiquity terminology and how that maps over to the real world so again, it's it's. I have a feeling that they're starting to become a really big player in the game, so they can sort of dictate that. Uh, one of the negatives that we saw, but I don't, I don't know. It doesn't have Wi-Fi six built in. I don't know if that's a negative thing at this point. I think Wi-Fi six is too new. I don't plan on keeping this for like fifteen years, but probably at least five at least five years. It should. I mean, but I still don't think Wi-Fi six will be that prevalent in five years. I don't know. Yeah, and this is, this is the thing about Ubiquity and, and their support model. 
um, you know, when, when Wi-Fi 6 rolls around, um, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure the Dream Machine will, if it doesn't have the hardware for it, it probably won't be able to. But if it's got the hardware there and they're just waiting on software, or uh, if you buy new access points with the ability to do Wi-Fi 6, then yeah, why not? Why not just add the capability through a software patch? So, yes, so I would have to buy new access points, but I guess that's a good thing because I can just spend the $100 or whatever it is on the access points. But again, it's uh, you look at it, Verizon charges you $250 for their router. Uh, this is $299. It's, a, it's basically the same thing. And then for $100, you can add uh, Ethernet port, an Ethernet cord, and an access point to wherever you want and get another thing. And then if you want cameras... Like I ha will talk about, I have some Arlo cameras that I like, but if you want cameras, I really wiring the cameras up may cost you a little more, but are so much better than the batteries and, and everything else. So IP cameras. And if you, I don't do VoIP. I think VoIP is too expensive to have just like one phone, but it's also a PBX solution and everything else. Yeah. I, I think I might have to go down this road. So I recently upgraded my PFSense box to the latest release. Um, and I, I hadn't logged in in a little bit. Um, so I logged in and one of the first boxes that pops up is a EULA. And usually with open source stuff, it's just like, hey, this is open source. By the way, uh, you know, here's the licenses for things. Here's what you're agreeing to. There's no warranty. We cool? Yeah, we're cool. That's not what this said. Instead, it said PFSense Community Edition. You agree to never use this in a business. If you do use it in the business, you're in violation. You have to pay us a license fee over here. They're taking PF Sense in a very pro only direction. Now, can you still use it in your house? Yes, absolutely. But with these changes, with it becoming a, a little bit more corporate and PF Sense going, going from like a nice open source project to a more commercialized business it's the same reason i got rid of the astaro security gateway way back in the day and moved to ps sense in the first place um you know i i think i might try open sense again but not feeling the pf sense love right now because everyone's trying to make money somehow and this is what they're doing yeah. and anyway <clears throat> look i I, so my big thumbs up for the what is it the 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 ubiquity dream machine it is it it is way more powerful than you're thinking of so it's you're like oh I want to try I want a little more fiddly controls there's a lot more fiddly things to do like a whole bunch and and I'm just starting like I'm not even scratching the surface so I'm spending an hour every day at night trying to do different things and finding some quirks, finding this, finding that. And I mean, I am liking it. I think it's awesome. I think the GUI is is understandable. You can you can secure, I don't wanna say securely do it remotely, but you sort of can. I mean, they, you, you log, basically you log in, but they give you a website they give you a website that you can access with a mobile app and everything else. And they take away the things that will make you hurt yourself. So, so that's pretty good. It is, it does have the different, the different devices have different features. So the best way to do it is to log in on a computer and do it that way. But I'm having fun with it. So <clears throat> now let's get to the bad part. And it's not necessarily the ubiquity, but it's the IOT part of it. So I have, you know, I have a lot of IOT devices and all of a sudden, things stopped working. So the idea was I was going to learn how to do um, segmented, a segmented IoT Wi-Fi network using the access points that give me four Wi-Fi networks. So in the past, if you wanted to do a guest, they they made you do a guest portal. So I didn't think I I don't want my guests logging into a guest portal. I just want them to put a password in and be done with it. But I wanted it segmented. So I found this uh, article by Rob Pickering. And he told, and he worked, I mean, we're going to link this. He d went through a really deep dive on how to make all these IOT things, but it's the same thing for a guest. Basically, Ubiquity figured this out and it will subnet, it will extra it exclude the subnet. So it won't let you on a guest network access the other, the other devices on the different subnets, which is exactly what you want. I mean, it's not perfect, but it works. And so I wanted to do the same thing with the IOT devices. So I follow this guide to set everything up. And that's when the problem started. <clears throat> so the first thing is Nest. Nest, I hate you. Nest thermostats, you hear me? I really, really hate you. So the Nest thermostats, they're beautiful, but 
they rely on power from the 24 volt wire from your thermostat from the boiler or furnace or whatever it is if something is wrong and and I, it took me a while to figure it out, and Tom will explain this hopefully, is that on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, if it doesn't have enough uh, power or bandwidth, it drops something. And guess what? It dropped that. And I didn't know this because I'm not an expert. And it took me a day or two to figure out why my thermostat wasn't working. Yeah. So in, in any any given network, there are going to be limits. Uh, and there's there's more limits than you realize because you've probably never hit some of them. Like... The actual NIC on your computer, the actual network interface card has its own limits. Your operating system has its own limits, right? If you exceed those, what generally happens is packets are dropped, right? You're doing some stuff. It's grabbing some stuff. Cool. All right. I've got this packet here. I've got that packet here. Ah, this one's too much. I'm throwing it away. And it literally just drops it off the stack and says, yep, well, it's TCP. Hopefully it'll retransmit. If it's UDP, yeah, it's gone. They knew what they were bargaining for. Um, and everything from your NIC to the cables to your operating system to even the Wi-Fi radio spectrum in the air has these limits. Now, if something is too crowded, if too much data is coming in, uh, if even one channel on the Wi-Fi access point, if it is oversaturated, things will drop. And if you have a device that is dropping an inordinate amount of packets, a lot of times that device will give up and say, you know, this depends on how it's programmed, but for IoT stuff, a lot of them will say, yeah, I couldn't get too strong of a connection. Uh, clearly, we've lost the network. I'm just going to stop. It just stops trying. It's just like, all right, looks like a bad network. Sorry, I'm off. And it's in this case, it was uh, rate and beacon uh, limiting. Rate and okay. beacon controls. 2 2G data rate control. I've never heard of that. So I understand 2G and 5, 2 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. 5 gigahertz is more power and faster, but much, much closer. You can't go too far. So I understand the IoT device is putting in 2.4 because usually these are on the fringes of your network. They're, they're thermostats, they're, they're door locks, they're lights. They, they go all throughout your house. So they need to have some range. But this, this uh, rate hopping, was this was this nuisance that Nest couldn't handle? So that's why when you when you buy like let's say a mesh network like Eero or Google Nest or whatever it is, they they you should check your IoT devices with them because they have sort of the same problem because of the handshakes. That's the other thing, the handshakes between the different access points and everything. You want to make sure your IoT devices uh, uh, work with them. And I have an old, I have a few old Nests and. They just wouldn't work. And this took me a day or two to try and figure it out. And the problem is Nest throws up an error that your wiring is wrong. Not that they're wrong, but your wiring is wrong. Now what? What are you going to, going to do? We're in the middle of a pandemic and and not too many electricians or HVAC people know Nest, so they don't want to really touch it. So it's on you. And Nest supports like, yeah, due to safety, you can email us and we'll get back to you. So I... Uh, so I, I found it. I'm linking this also in the show notes. It's a Reddit thread where you have to click more, but it goes through on on how to solve this problem. But that's that's what I had to do. Today, my Arlo's, my cameras, uh, the Wi-Fi didn't work on something, and I was fixing that, and I couldn't find it, and I had to do a reset, and all these devices on seemingly this, it, this should have been a much more beefed up network. We're just having problems, so... Not an IoT fan right now. Yeah, and a lot of these devices will have, you know, weird, weird errors like that, right? It's it's rarely ever so clear as, hey, man, your Wi-Fi keeps kicking me, so I'm going to stop trying. It'd be great if error messages were that way. It would be great if all error messages were designed by the same people who developed the Rust compiler error messages, where the Rust compiler says, hey, man, you put false in here. It's not a Boolean variable. What are you even thinking? Can you can you please get this out of my face? I don't want this. Look, it's right here. It's on this line. It's at this character. Fix that. We'll be good. It's not that way with IoT. With IoT, you're going to get weird errors. I, I have personally encountered the weirdest errors with the Nest thermostat. And I, I am almost loving the fact that I live in an apartment right now without air conditioning. It's pretty common for this area wasn't common back in ohio uh but the fact that i haven't hooked up that nest and i found it in a box the other day 
just fills me with joy. I no longer have to put up with that. Uh, I, I was very unhappy uh, with, with my time with the nest. It was great for like the first year. After that, it was just one pain after another. Uh, seemingly after Google bought the company. Related? Not sure. Uh, I mean, look, I, I tell the nests are beautiful. But you know what my recommendation is? For, first, my first recommendation, check your uh, electric and gas company because PSE&G here on the East Coast will will give you like 80% off a Nest or an Echo B or a Honeywell. So before you buy anything, check there, see what they have. But you know what? The old, the Honeywell ones that you're used to, like the new programmable ones that have Wi-Fi built in, all you're doing is in your bed, you're hot or you're cold and you're adjusting the temperature. That is literally all you're doing. Uh, you, you really don't need the smart sense. You really don't need all those extra features. They're nice, but they're not that smart. Like I, I turn yeah. down the heat and then magically like it goes back up. And I'm like, what's going three times? I'm turning it down. It's not working because of the smarts. So yeah. uh, initially I was, I was thrilled with my nest because I remember like in the first couple of weeks, cause I bought it like right at the beginning of summer, Nest sent a push notification to my phone. I think I think it was actually a Nexus one. It was something really old. And it said, hey, uh, we noticed that there's a heat wave moving through your area right now. We have started cooling off your house, you know, before while you're at work. So when you get home, it'll be nice and comfortable. I was like, oh, wow, that's great. But then the scheduling features kind of took on this weird bend. And if my schedule changed just a little bit, it would try to remember that. And it's like, oh, hey, I noticed that. You know, you were up at four in the morning. Yes, I was up at four in the morning because I got paged into work. That is not my usual time. So four in the morning, I hear the AC kick on. I'm like, come on, man. I'm asleep. Yeah. You woke me up. And it doesn't need to be cold right now. I'm asleep. But yeah, I I could go on and on about my problems with Nest and how their smart features were really not that smart. <laughs> or they were extremely smart and trying to sabotage me because of the robot uprising. Well, I mean, I mean, seven years ago or eight years ago now, they were, I mean, that was as good as we can do. Now we can do a lot better. Uh, I'm just trying to think of all the other devices. And it just goes, as people are buying these more devices, they're skimping on the wi the internal Wi-Fi that's connecting. If, if it's a device that should be far away from where people would put a router, like garage door opener. That's probably pretty far away through metal and everything else. They should obviously account for that. Uh, it's it's with the with the four minutes we have left, and you we were talking about at the beginning of the nest. You were telling me, oh, the the five gigahertz spectrum didn't even come out yet, and I said, well, they should they should have forethought it and and fixed this. But that's another thing. You buy a thermostat, it should last X number of years. Uh, it's really hard to tell somebody, oh, uh, your thermostat's only two years old. You spent $250 on it. Now you got to replace it. And we're starting to see these companies now during the pandemic are just are just like going under because they can't get the revenue, the support, whatever it is. And they're just leaving a whole slew of people just out in the cold. Wink did that. If you have a Wink Hub, they're just, sorry, we're packing. Oh, pay us monthly. Pay us monthly or you're done. And automatic, I have an automatic thing for my car. It's a little dongle that plugs in. They're like, uh, even though you're paying monthly, sorry, we're just closing up shop, sorry. And it just goes to show IoT is not ready, whether it's skimping on the parts for the Wi-Fi or or just being able to support itself. If, they're, if you're buying it, be ready for it to not work tomorrow. Yeah, I, I wouldn't make any IoT device like, you know, a part of core infrastructure of, of your household, right? Like if, if you're throwing up, you know, a security camera to watch like in front of your house, your garage or a doorbell camera, cool, fine. That's it's all well and good if it's solving a problem, but don't make it something that's so essential that you can't get rid of it, right? If you rely, if you absolutely rely on that Nest thermostat being perfect 100% of the time and always supported, might you might want to shy away from that you might want to get something a little bit dumber a little bit cheaper a little bit more reliable those all tend to go hand in hand unfortunately when you talk about iot and the other thing to keep in mind the s in iot stands for security yeah, yeah it's so i don't have any more th uh cheap thermostats so if something happens i have to literally go out and buy something so to have some fallbacks uh like 
I I really want one of the quick set Z Wave locks, and I'm not there yet. Like I'm really trying hard. I I put the cheap one on my garage, my external garage that is completely segregated from my house. And I was even nervous about that, but it's like, that would be cool to, to tell it to lock because they do have fail safes. But again, will Quickset be around in 10 years? Most likely. Like I'm not too worried about Quickset or Slage. I just, I don't know if Z-Wave will be around in 10 years. I don't know if uh, I bought my Philips Hue light bulbs because you know what? They're really good LED light bulbs just in case Philips packs up and says, sorry, we're going home. You don't need the internet for that. But these other little like light bulb, uh, not light bulbs, like switches and everything else. I'm not happy if tomorrow they closed up shop, but I'm not too, th- I'm not too upset. And if, if you want something that's relatively simple, right? Like if, if you quite literally just want a, a tiny device that you can stick somewhere that tweets the temperature in various classrooms around your school, <laughs> these guys are great. Raspberry Pi, it's it's 30 bucks. You go, you buy a pack of these, you buy like a pallet of them and you stick them wherever. And the best part is it's a generic computer that you can put and, and load your own software, your own programs. And with these GPIO ports on it, like you can make that thing do anything. Uh, so... If, if you've got a technical mindset, if you want a project, if you want something that, at the very least, if it's not supported, you can build a Super Mario Brothers game machine out of it. Yeah, Raspberry Pi. They're great. I, I can't say anything nicer about them. They're just fantastic. I said, uh, well, I, I like my dream machine. I know it's a little more expensive than a Raspberry Pi, but I'm able now to fully control different things and and go from there and my wife is letting me do it she, i'm very short leash right now but i'm able to do it and i'm happy about that anyway we're out of time uh again no no actual security news this week i mean yeah nothing like like hard hitting it's so been quiet. that that's a good thing so This is all we can talk about, just different products that we like and things that we're going through. So hopefully we have something else for you next week. If not, we'll see you the week after. Okay, bye, everyone. See you, everyone. We forgot to say Keybase got bought out. Oh, yeah. We can cover that next Mm, week. We'll we'll have time to tell everyone to migrate.